Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Transcripto Transcriptome Assembly, Computational Challenges of Next Generation Sequence Data. I am Bob Woodard, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few announcements before we begin. This presentation is designed as an interactive event, and we encourage you to submit questions during the, during the broadcast. You, you can submit your questions by clicking on the green Q&A button in the lower left corner of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right of the slide window. If you have any technical problems with the audio or visual part of this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem to the green Q&A button on the lower left. I would like to now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Steven Salzberg. Dr. Salzberg is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Biomedical Engineering, Computer Science, and Biostatistics, and the Director of the Center for Computational Biology at Johns Hopkins University. After completing his PhD at Harvard in 1979, Dr. Salzberg joined Hopkins as an Assistant Professor of Computer Science, and from 1997 to 2005, he was Senior Director of Bioinformatics at the Institute for Genomic Research in Rockville, Maryland. From 2005 to 2011, Dr. Salzberg was the director for the Center of Bioinformatics and Computational Biology and the Horvitz Professor of Computer Science at University of Maryland College Park. In recent years, Dr. Salzberg and his students have introduced several pioneering highly efficient systems for analysis of next generation sequencing data, including the Bowtie, Top Hat, and Cufflink systems, which are now used by thousands of labs around the world. All the group software, is free and open source, and their systems have been downloaded thousands of times. In addition to his software system, Dr. Salzberg has contributed analyses to many genome sequencing projects, including the human genome, multiple plant and animal genomes, and many bacteria. He was co-founder of the Influenza, Ge Influenza Genome Sequencing Project, the first large-scale genomic study of the human influenza virus. Dr. Salzberg has authored or co-authored over 250 scientific publications. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and of the International Society for Computer Biology, Computational Biology. He was the 2013 winner of the Benjamin Franklin Award for Open Access in the Life Sciences and the 2013 winner of the Robert G. Bales Prize in Critical Thinking for his Forbes Science Column. In 2001 and again in 2014, Dr. Salzberg was listed as a highly cited researcher by Thomas Thomson Reuters, a compilation of the 1% most cited researchers in the world. Please welcome me and please join me in welcoming Dr. Salzberg. I'll now turn the presentation over to him. Okay, thanks very much, Bob. So today I'm gonna to talk about transcriptome assembly and the computational challenges that, it, that this entails. Uh, with next generation sequence data. Um, uh, first, let me just quickly point out that my lab does work in a number of different areas. Uh, one of them is transcriptome analysis, which is today's topic. Um, and uh, that involves how you take the sequences that come off of a next generation sequencer and uh, align them to a genome and turn them into information about which genes are present. We'll talk, I'll talk much more about that uh, over the course of the next 45 minutes. Uh, but I also work on uh, two somewhat different areas I just wanted to mention. One is uh, genome assembly or de novo assembly, which is the problem of taking uh, sequences and putting them, uh, short sequences and putting them back together to reconstruct chromosomes uh, for, new, for genomes that haven't been assembled before. And another is, is uh, the human microbiome, which is studying the, the microbial life that lives on our bodies and inside of our bodies. And some of the techniques in each of these areas are, are related to what I'll talk about today, but I'm not really going to talk about that work. So let me move on and talk about um, uh, next generation sequence data and the transcriptome assembly problems. So first, let's go back in time a little bit to uh, 2001. Uh, the Human Genome was published, um, as, as I'm sure you all know. Um, there was a, an exciting race to get that done. Um, it concluded with these two publications in February of 2001, one paper published in Science, by a private group um, led by Celera Genomics, um, a group that I collaborated with at the time, and another um, much larger consortium of, of publicly funded groups that published their paper on the human genome in the, in the journal Nature. 
And that was the culmination of work that started in 1989 when the Human Genome Project was launched. And it was a, a really impressive activity and the amount of sequencing, amount of analysis went into that was, was enormous. Um, and, and yet, looking back on it today, uh, not that long, uh, not that much later, we, can, uh, we could actually say that the amount of data that went into it is not big at all compared to what the kind of volumes we're dealing with today. So, um, so times have changed uh, due to the introduction of next generation sequence data. So let me just give an example to illustrate um, how they changed since, since those days a few years ago. Um, th these are some numbers from an exome sequencing project that we, that we did here at Hopkins where we're, uh, we're sequencing thousands of exomes in, in an effort to understand human disease. So this is not a project I'm gonna really talk about, but, but um, briefly the goals of, of this project are to um, take people who have some apparently genetic disorder and sequence just the gene containing regions, the exome uh, from their genome and compare their, their exome to other members of their family, typically their parents, to see if there are mutations that might be responsible for, um, for their disease. So I just wanna give this as an example of the scale of sequencing. So if you look at the human and mouse genomes back in 2001 and then 2002 when the mouse genome was published, the number of reads, that is individual sequences generated by the sequencer um, for those genomes is around 35 million. Um, the reads were longer than we used Sanger sequencing technologies. They were about 650 base pairs on average. Um, and if you add that up, you get about 22.8 billion um, bases for those projects to, to, get the, to generate the genome. And the cost was around, for the mouse genome, the cost was around $26 million. Um, for one of the trios of parent, uh, child and two parents that we did um, uh, two years ago here at Hopkins, we generated 235 million reads. They were shorter reads. This is typical for an exome. We generate about this many reads today. Um, the, the reads were only 100 base pairs long, so they were shorter. But the total number of bases was very close to the same. It was about 23 and a half billion reads. However, the cost of those three exomes um, a year and a half ago was $5,000, and that cost is already lower today. So that just illustrates that the cost of sequencing is over 5,000 times cheaper. And if you look at the throughput of our sequencing machines, the, the, the speed up is even greater than that. So that means that we have um, enormous challenges to deal with all of this data, and that's created opportunities and challenges for people like me to develop algorithms for processing this data. So, um, so one of the, the key concerns we have is that any algorithm that you use to process data sets of this size, millions of reads or hundreds of millions of reads or even billions of reads, your algorithms have to be very fast, have to be very careful about how they, uh, how they use memory as well. Otherwise, you'll overwhelm your computational sources. So uh, one observation that's, also, that's often made, uh, I've made it myself, is that they, the acceleration and improvements in efficiency and sequencing technology have dramatically outpaced improvements in computer speeds over the past 15 years. And that means that although uh, in 2001, when the human genome was published, we could keep up with uh, the data, um, today we often can't. The data is coming out of our sequencers faster than our computers can process it. So one of the first um, programs that, that we developed in my group was a program uh, for aligning reads um, to the genome. So one of the first things you want to do when you sequence, you generate a, a sequence is, uh, if it's human, is uh, figure out where it came from. So we have the human genome, and one way we use that is we have a reference assembly of the genome. Uh, and although it's, it's only an assembly of one particular person, uh, one thing we can do uh, for our analysis is we can take short reads that are say 100 base pairs long, or maybe a couple hundred base pairs long, and align them to the genome, the three billion base pair genome, and figure out where they came from. So um, back in 2009, uh, my former student, Ben Langley, who's now an assistant professor here at Hopkins, published, developed and published a method called Bowtie, which um, uh, was and still is one of the fastest uh, short read aligners, aligners for this test. And it uses a, a, a very clever uh, technique from computer science developed uh, in the data compression field called the Burroughs Wheel Transform to make it efficient. So this program is, uh, because it's very fast and, and very efficient in its use of memory, um, it's become, it quickly was, was adopted by, by hundreds of labs and later thousands of labs. It's been downloaded over 200,000 times and the papers describing it, um, the original paper, and then an update that Ben and I published in 2012 um, have, have received thousands of citations, which is quite unusual for a scientific paper. So that just illustrates the, the hunger there is for, for methods like this. Now, bow tie is a method that we use in transcriptome analysis, but I'm mostly gonna talk about the subsequent test. So, so uh, today I'm gonna talk about, um, focus on how you analyze RNA-seq data. So RNA-seq data is a little more complicated. You need to do more than just take the reads and align them to the genome 
and figure out where they came from and perhaps figure out what the, uh, the differences are, which you might do in a genetic study. So for RNA-seq, the pipeline looks something like this to, to sort of simplify things uh, a little extremely. Um, we, we generate um, sequence from RNA rather than from DNA. So to do that, there's a lot of laboratory steps that I, that I won't go into, but you can't sequence RNA. So we have to turn it into DNA and that introduces some biases um, that we have to worry about later on computationally. Um, but you turn it into DNA um, and then, then you do the same thing you do with the DNA sequence. You sequence it on a high throughput sequencer generating reads that are typically 100 base pairs long, and they often come in pairs that you can keep track of. So your fragments of RNA might be, say, two or 300 base pairs long, and you sequence both ends, capturing 100 base pairs from each end. Um, once you have those reads of the sequencer, that's where the software really gets to work. It has to then align them to the genome. Um, and the alignment now is going to, as I'll explain a little bit more in a few minutes, the alignment is going to have to do more than simply the, the task of bow ties, it's going to have to do more than just align the reads end to end, but it's going to have to account for the structure of genes as they're laid out on the genome. But for an RNA-seq experiment, we want to do much more than that. We actually want to reassemble the original transcripts, that is the genes that were being transcribed, that were being copied from DNA to RNA. Um, and we want to figure out for each of those transcripts, we'd like to know how much of it was present in the original sample. So we want to quantitate those transcripts. Uh, and even beyond that, we would like to compare the gene expression in one sample to the gene expression in another sample. So we want to do what's called computing differential expression. So we would like software to go from these raw reads to this nice, ideally a nice readout showing us between our cases and our controls, which genes were overexpressed and which, which genes went up in expression, which went down in expression and by how much. So that's, that's what, what the biologist wants. And somehow we have to get from this raw read data to this very, very uh, complicated readout of which genes were expressed and what their levels were. So my lab has developed, my students and, and postdocs have developed a suite of tools that handle all the steps of this process. I mentioned bow tie already. Um, after doing alignment with bow tie, then you need to worry about splice line, which I'm going to explain in a little more detail next um, to account for the presence of introns. And then you have to take um, those alignments and assemble them together to reconstruct the genes that were present in the sample. And we developed a program called Cufflinks for that. I was a former student of mine named Cole Trapnell. Uh, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Washington. Um, and Cufflinks does more than just assemble them, it also quantitates the transcripts. And then there's a, a fourth program called CuffDiff, now CuffDiff2, also developed by Cole Trapnell, um, that can tell you the, which genes were different should express between two sets of experiments. So all of these papers, um, all these programs are very popular. All of them have been cited um, an enormous number of times, over 2,000 times in each case and over 5,000 times in the case of Bowtie. Uh, just to show you, not, not only are people using them, but they're using them as part of scientific papers that they're, and they're then citing the tools. However, we haven't um, rested on our laurels. Those tools were mostly developed in 2009, 2010. Um, um, we've now developed some new tools that I'll tell you about today. Um, Bowtie 2, as I already mentioned, came out a couple of years ago. Um, very recently, just uh, in the last couple of months, we published a new splice aligner called HiSat, which is a, a successor to Top Hat, but uses a totally different algorithm. And we published a, a new transcriptome assembler called StringTie that does assembly and quantitation. And, and my colleagues, Jeff Leak and Alyssa Brzee, published uh, another, another program I will not talk about called Bellgown, which does the differential expression step. So let's, let's look at the um, splice alignment problem in a little more detail now. So before I talk about HiSet, let me explain about TopHat2, which was a major improvement over the original TopHat program. And this was the work of Daywon Kim, who's a um, former grad student, now a postdoc uh, in my lab. So let's, let me describe what the problem is first. So the challenge here is we have these short reads. They might only be 100 base pairs long, and sometimes they're even shorter than that. It's not uncommon even today to get reads that are, that are 75 base pairs long, um, or occasionally even 50 base pairs. And we get them in pairs, and we want to align them to the genome and figure out not only where they came from, but it's possible that these reads, and many of these reads, um, in fact, span introns. So this is a little cartoon showing you here. Uh, the red boxes are exons, and the skinnier lines connecting them are the introns. And in yellow, I'm showing you a read that spans an intron. So we want to be able to figure out that this read aligns to two different exons. Um, and we want to do that without knowing what the genes are. So the first attempt to do this, um, when, when RNA-seq was first invented only about six years ago, would just take the predicted genes or the known genes and create the, uh, the, the transcripts that we, we know about by concatenating together the exons, and then you can simply align the reads to, to the transcripts. But when we're aligning the reads to the genome, 
if we don't know where the, where the genes are, then we have to allow the reads to be split in a line in two or sometimes more than two places if they span more than two exons. So how do you do that? So here's one idea, and this is the basis for the algorithm in, in the original top hat program. Um, well, let's just take the reads and align them um, using bow tie and, and any read that match, matches end to end uh, within an exon will align very nicely. So we can just do, do that step first. That's very fast. And from that, we can assemble together these little intervals that are covered by, um, by aligned reads. And those will be exons or in most cases, parts of exons. They won't generally go all the way to the edge of the exon, although they might. Then um, from, from those locations, we can find nearby splice sites. Now, human introns almost always start with GT and end with AG. Um, we can allow for um, a couple of other um, uh, alternative splice sites in, in top hat, but let's just assume it's GTAG. So generally, um, we are pretty close to the ends of exons when we do this first alignment step. So we find the GT uh, sites that are near the, the beginnings of introns and the HG sites that are near the ends of, of exons, of introns rather. And, and then computation, we can, we can then uh, concatenate what we think are the exons defined by those sites and ask, do we have a read, do we have any reads that haven't aligned yet that would align to this hypothesized splice junction? And if we do, uh, then we're done. So that's how the original top hat did it. It created the, um, the possible splice junctions based on this initial round of alignment and then looked for uh, initially unmapped reads that would align across those splice junctions. And that works quite well. Um, there's, there are a number of problems that occur. And one, one of the, some of them um, were, uh, the biggest ones were addressed in top hat too. One is the problem of pseudogenes, which we hadn't thought about at the very beginning of, a, of this sort of endeavor. So, so what's the problem with pseudogenes? So for splice alignment. So here's a, here's a cartoon of a pseudogene. We have a gene here with uh, half a dozen exons uh, shown in green with the red parts being the untranslated part of the uh, exons. Um, and so normally this gene, which is in two copies, so at the top here, normally this gene would be transcri transcribed, all the uh, introns would be removed. So the skinnier lines or the introns would be removed and the exons concatenate together in the, uh, as you're producing the RNA. And, uh, and the cell then adds a poly A tail, a string of A's to the end of it. And that gets then later translated to produce a protein. Well, once in a while, evolutionarily speaking, once in a while, um, a virus which is infecting the cell, which has a reverse transcriptase as part of its genome, will take that RNA, it'll reverse transcribe it back into DNA and integrate it into our genome. Now, this is generally speaking a rare event in our lifetimes, but over the course of evolutionary time, this happens pretty often. And in fact, has affected the human genome uh, many times. There's, uh, there's, there's over 14,000 um, pseudogenes known in the human genome. And many of these pseudogenes are, are nearly identical to, um, to the gene they came from. So why is this a problem for alignment? The problem is if you look at this slide, um, let's consider that little uh, read right in the middle, that little red um, rectangle um, that spans two exons in the middle of this gene. So the true alignment, the correct alignment of that, of that read should be to those two exons. However, if the pseudogene version of this gene is fairly recent, as many of them are, then that, that read will align end to end very nicely to the pseudogene copy. Now, generally speaking, almost always pseudogenes are not transcribed. So that's not the correct alignment. That's not where this read came from. Um, however, if you're just doing alignment, you'll find a nice end to end alignment using that algorithm I just described. Um, and you'll never even try to look at a spliced alignment of this gene. So we have to deal with that, uh, with that kind of problem. Otherwise, these pseudogenes will essentially absorb all the reads that come from the genes. So in top hat two, the solution was um, in, in sort of a overview fashion was uh, create transcripts um, using the splice sites we discovered on the initial round uh, of alignment and then take the reads um, that aligned uh, that aligned end to end initially and ask is there is there an alignment in the transcripts that we in the alignment that spans one of the introns we've discovered um, and if there is um, realign that read and assign it to what we believe is the, what's usually the, the correct copy. So basically you rely on the fact that um, you are usually gonna find the correct exons. It's just that you won't have, uh, for genes that have a pseudogene copy, you just won't have enough reads assigned to them. So you go after you've found those, those transcripts, you can go back and, and find reads that you aligned to the wrong place and realign them and put them in the right place. So that requires a second round. So that was in top hat two. And the result of that and a number of other very clever uh, improvements that Daywon Kim came up with were uh, are summarized in this table, and we have others like this. And this, this is showing you simulated data, um, which we use because with simulated data, we know exactly where the reads came from. 
Um, and you can see the accuracy shown along the first column, just the, the overall number of correctly mapped reads for top hat along the top, and then four other widely used splice aligners shown along the left. And all of them do pretty well in the 90% or above range if you just look at overall alignments. But I'll draw your attention to the, to the number of reads and uh, aligned correctly across junctions, which is the third column of numbers. It says correct junction reads. Those are the reads that span a splice site. And Top Hat still does very well with those, but not at 99%, but still 97.5% of those are aligned correctly. So, and most of the other programs drop fairly substantially, except for Map Splice in this case. And, and the really most difficult reads to align are the ones that have very short anchors. So we define that here as a read where only 10 bases or fewer aligns to one of the exons, and the rest of the read aligns to another exon. Those are really hard to align because you have a very short anchor. You only have a little tiny piece um, that you have to then figure out where it goes, and it might be anchored thousands of base pairs away. So because of this sort of two-pass algorithm that Top Hat uses, it still gets 96% of those correct, whereas some of the other programs, um, except for Map Splice, the other programs all get 20% or fewer of those, of those um, types of alignments correct. So those are the really hard ones. So, um, so that, those improvements actually improved the sensitivity of Top Hat. It made it, made it um, even better than uh, Top Hat 2, even better than Top Hat 1 but we want it to be faster. So because of all these additional things it's doing, it was slowing down and the data sets are, um, have been growing. So um, how do we get more speed? So, uh, so day one, Kim had the idea, um, well, we used Bowtie for the first step because it's so fast. So why don't we try to use the Burroughs Wheeler Transform, that data structure and the algorithms go with it, which are very, very fast. Why don't we try to use that for everything or at least as much as we can? So that's sort of the idea. Um, the implementation though is, is another thing. So how do you do that? So that idea is implemented in a new program called HiSAT, which stands for Hierarchical Indexing for Splice Alignment Transcripts. And uh, there's a picture of day one. Um, and the idea in summary is shown here. So you create a global index as before, a uh, Burroughs Wheel Transform, which you then index with something called the FM index for the whole human genome. And then you create a huge number, 48,000 um, additional indices, each of them very small, only covering 64 kilobases. Um, and so they're all very small indices in there and they span the genome end to end and you make them overlap by one KB. So these indexes tile the genome with a small overlap at the end of each one. So let me tell you how we then, you, and you can search them all with the same algorithm, this Burroughs Wheel Transform based algorithm, which comes from, um, from Bowtie. So let's, 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 let me describe how we do that. So um, first of all, first let me, let me point out that it might seem like well, we're creating this huge number of new index, indices won't that take a huge amount of memory? Won't that be a problem for, um, for running this on any kind of reasonable computer? Uh, well, after a lot of very clever optimizations, day one, I was able to get this um, to fit into just 4.3 gigabytes for the human genome. So 4.3 gigs is not too bad. Most of you probably have eight gigs on your, on your desktop or laptops today. So you can run this on a standard desktop machine without any problem for the, for the human genome. So, so here's how the algorithm works. And I'll try to show you, give you the sense of why it's why it's so much faster too. So let's just look quickly at three examples of three reads shown in red here. Um, and let's talk about how I set with one. So what I'm showing you here across the top is a little, a little piece of, of a human chromosome with two exons separated by an intron. Um, and in the middle, I, they're labeled E1 and E2. In the middle, I have those exons concatenated and I have three reads uh, labeled one, two, and three shown as red rectangles that align to those two exons. So the reads are in red, the exons are in yellow, and, and the introns are in gray. So um, for example one was, is an exon here that, that, um, that just aligns uh, within, an, within uh, an exon. So it's right here. Um, so that's easy. We just use the global bow tie index and, and that um, aligns as, as, as it did in top hat one and top hat two. Um, now let's look at a harder example. Here we have a read with a, with a short anchor. So this read aligns, uh, read number two aligns in exon two, um, but it overlaps, um, the, it sort of extends into exon one by only a little bit. So what, what HiSET does is it first anchors the read using the global index, that's the little blue arrow there is sort of indicating, you just go right to left and then you notice and discover that, okay, this read aligns to exon two and you anchor it and then you extend that alignment within exon two until you get to a mismatch and that's shown in purple there. Uh, and then, and that may leave us a, a few bases at the end where we can't align. So what do we do? We then pull out um, the local index. So here's where we use those little tiny indices. We already know where we are. We now have a little tiny piece of DNA. It might be eight or 10 bases long. 
The problem that the top hat and other splice lawyers had is they would have to go back and look at the entire genome to see where does that 10 bases match? And it's gonna match in a lot of places. However, if we look in a local index, which is only 64,000 bases long, then that little 10 base pair piece in most cases will match in only one place and will be the correct place. Sometimes it won't match at all. Maybe our intron is longer than 64 KB, in which case we'll just go and get the next index to the left in this picture. Um, and sometimes it might match in say two places, but rarely in more than, than one or two places. So our, our, our search is greatly constrained by the fact that we have a very small window that we're searching in. And we, we used the, the initial search to anchor ourselves and pull out this index. Um, so once we do that, we then search in this little local index for that little piece. And generally we find that very quickly. And then now we have our spliced alignment. And then our third example is just a slightly easier version of that where we have the exon, uh, the read spanning two exons with a big anchor in both exons. But the operation works very much like before. We start by anchoring the alignment in exon two. We pull out the local index uh, and then we take the rest of the read and we uh, find that it matches in exon one. And instead of just a little local search, we have to extend the match a little bit. But it works very similar to, the, to example two. So how does this work? How well does this work? Well, here's, here's a picture on simulated data. Um, again, we use simulated data because we know the answer, but we have lots of data, lots of results on real data as well. So here, this, this pie chart just shows you different kinds of, of exons. So um, to quickly kind of give you a sense of what's going on, this is from a simulation, which is fairly realistic. So most reads do tend to align within exons. So the big red part is the number of the percentage of all the reads that align inside of exons. Um, the next most common type of read is shown in blue. Those are the ones that align across two exons with an anchor of more than 10 bases in each exon. And then the, the, green, um, the green and the sort of uh, light green wedges show you the, the uh, reads that align across two exons where one of the anchors is either small or really, really small that is less than uh, uh, one to, just one to seven bases. And then we have a few reads shown in purple, a small percentage shown in purple that'll span three or more exons that are even harder to align. So how do we do on those? Um, so first, uh, in terms of speed, the whole point of PySat is to be fast by using this um, more sophisticated indexing strategy. So this chart shows you speed measured in reads per second. And on the left, you see sort of two versions of PySat. I should say the default version is called PySat H in this chart, but it's just PySat if you download the program. Um, and so they're both about the same speed. They run at 140,000, about 140,000 reads per second. Um, the only other program that really can match that in speed is STAR, which is a little slower, but still over 100,000 reads per second. And you see at the, at the far right there, um, Top Hat is not very fast. So this is about 38 times faster than Top Hat in this experiment. And generally we find that it's, it's going to be 30 or 40 times faster than Top Hat on, on most of the data sets we've looked at. So it's much faster, but of course you care about accuracy, um, perhaps more than anything. So here's sensitivity, the number of the percentage of those reads that are aligned and you see over on the far right, Top Hat is up at over 98%, and HiSat also is at over 98%, and all the other programs are somewhat lower. And I should just be clear here, the, the, the y-axis here goes from 88% to 100%, so if all the programs are doing well, they're all at 92% or above, um, but we just showed this little part to emphasize the differences. So anyway, HiSat did not, does not sacrifice any accuracy to get that speed. Um, and then um, to zoom in a little bit on, on, on one detail, the hardest reads to align are the ones that have a very short anchor. That, that's always the problem where you have anchor. These are the ones with anchors of just one to seven bases. That is, you have a read where uh, 93 to 99 of the bases align in one exon and only one to seven bases align in the next exon over. So you have to look very hard if you want to find out where that goes. Many of the programs simply give up on those or fail to align the read at all. And you can see that here in this accuracy. And here the y-axis goes from zero to 100%. So you see a lot of the programs really have trouble with that. Um, but HiSat is able to align over 80% of these, and the only program that can beat it is, is Top Hat 2, which can get, um, which can do a little better on these very short anchors, um, at the cost of, as you saw before, um, a huge increase in um, compute time. So that was just published. This paper was just published uh, in March of this year, and the software is available um, at our website. So now let me turn to the to the other main problem I want to talk about today, which is the transcriptome assembly problem which is to take these alignments and put them together into complete transcripts. And for that, I want to tell you about a new program called StringTie that was developed by Ella Pertea, who's an assistant professor here at Hopkins in, in uh, the Center for Computational Biology. So there's, there's two, let me just sort of back up a tiny bit and say there's two major approaches for transcriptome assembly. And by transcriptome, I mean the collection of all 
the, the RNA transcripts that are present in a, in a cell or a collection of cells. Um, so that is all the genes that are, that are active. So the, there, are, there are two major approaches. The one I'm going to talk about today is shown here on the left, where you take your reads from your RNA-seq experiment, you align them to the genome, you produce alignments and splice alignments with programs like, like Bowtie and HiSat, uh, and then you assemble those together, and, and you're trying to not only assemble the uh, transcripts for each gene, but you want for each gene to know which isoforms of that gene are present, and you want to quantitate those. Um, however, you don't have to do alignment. There are programs, which I won't talk about at all, um, except to mention them here, um, that can do assembly de novo of the transcripts just by looking at the reads and, and as you do with whole genome assembly, computing how they overlap one another, and then taking those assembled transcripts and you might then align those to the genome if you have one. Um, that's a much harder task and generally doesn't work as well. However, it's very, very useful and in fact essential for cases where you don't have a genome. Uh, of course, I'm talking today about um, RNA-seq on the human genome where we have a very good reference assembly. But if you don't have any reference assembly at all, or you have one which is very poor, then you might want to try de novo transcriptome assembly. But now let's go on and talk about this um, genome-guided uh, or reference-guided transcriptome assembly. So the motivation for string ties, so as I said at the beginning, um, Cufflinks do, does exactly this task, and we've been using that quite successfully for five years in our lab and in many, many hundreds of other labs. Um, but the motivation was this example shown here where um, we had this, um, we're looking with a collaborator, um, Josh Mendel, at, at uh, microRNAs, and we're looking at this particular microRNA cluster that occurs in an intron of this gene shown um, at the top. It's a little hard to see, so um, if I just draw this arrow here, see those, there's two isoforms of this gene, one with just two exons and one with, with more smaller exons, and, and Cufflinks was unable to assemble this correctly. We tried many different settings. In the middle of the slide, we have all the different transcript assemblies that couplings produce with different, different settings, and it never produced these two, um, these two what we knew to be correct assemblies. So um, after um, experimenting with different settings of couplings, um, we decided to try a new algorithm entirely, and that ended up after um, about two years worth of development, um, it ended up being the string tie system that we've just um, recently released and published. So there's two new ideas in string tie. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on the second one, but let me mention both. Um, one is that we can assemble the reads de novo first. Um, as I just said a minute ago, you don't really need to do that. Um, you can just align them. But if a reads assemble in an unambiguous way, then why not do it? You might be able to then, you can essentially get longer reads out of that. Uh, and that should help. Um, but the, the core of the string tie algorithm is a different, different way of, of, of producing the transcripts, of assembling the transcripts themselves, and of computing um, the quantities. And in, inherent in this method is that you're doing assembly and quantitation of transcripts simultaneously or in sort of the same step. Um, and that's not the way that any other method works. So um, let me uh, kind of give you a little bit more detail about that. Um, so, so it's sort of a semi, you can call this a semi-hybrid approach because you're doing some, um, some assembly. So you start with the RNA-seq reads. You assemble them into something we call super reads, which I'm not going to really explain, but it's a conservative assembly step. You're not trying to assemble every transcript end to end, but just assembling things um, a little bit. Um, and in fact, in the current version of string dot, all we do is take a pair of reads that come from the same original fragment, and we try to see if we can assemble them into one longer read. So the fragments generally are going to be two or 300 bases with read lengths of 100. So we try to turn those pairs of reads into single longer reads using this assembly step. But in principle, we can go much much uh, far beyond that, and we're, we're uh, working on that as a part of our future development. So once you've got those super reads, you align the super reads and the original reads, because you know not all of them get, get converted into super reads. Line them, line them to the genome using um, Bowtie and Top Hat, or Bowtie and HiSat. Uh, and uh, then you have these alignments, which are then the input, the main input to the string tie algorithm. Um, and from those alignments, you then do assembly. So string tie, just like couplings, doesn't actually do alignment. It works with alignments as input. Uh, and in principle, you could use alignments from other aligners as well um, as input to, to string tie. And what you'd like to do is to assemble the transcripts and produce for every locus of the genome all the different isoforms of that locus, that is the different um, um, patterns of exons and introns, and quantities for each of those, each of those isoforms. So here's an outline how the algorithm works. So given a, a, a locus or a bundle of reads that all uh, align to the same locus, um, the assembly uh, algorithm builds a splice graph, which I'll explain a little bit more in a, in a second. 
uh, and then it iterates through these two major steps. So first, um, in the splice graph that corresponds to this gene, uh, so we're doing this one gene at a time. So in the splice graph, we find the, the heaviest path, the path with the heaviest coverage that has the most reads assigned to it. So that, um, what that represents is the, the isoform of this gene that has the highest level of expression. So we're gonna assemble that one first. Uh, and then um, we build a different network, uh, which I'll show you in a couple slides, uh, called the flow network. And we use that to estimate the abundance of this isoform. Uh, and then we, we iterate, we then remove all those, all those reads that we've assigned this isoform, remove them from the, uh, from the graph, recompute the, the, the splice graph and recompute the flow network again, and keep going until you've explained all the data. So you just iterate until there's nothing else to explain or until there's so little left that it's not worth explaining, so you're below some threshold. So let me um, say what a splice graph is first, uh, next. So here's a splice graph uh, of a gene with, um, with um, a number of different exons. So the exons are shown um, here in orange uh, along the top, aligned to the genome. And you can see there's multiple, this is intentionally a little complicated. There's multiple um, alternative splice variants. In some cases, you have exons that are simply skipped or introns that are included. Um, you have exons that, can, that have more than one um, beginning or end, alternative um, splice sites and beginning or end of the exons. And so from the alignments, you can figure out where these things are. What the splice graph is, if you look at the graph below, that's a splice graph representing these alignments. And um, you have an edge in this graph for, for every place where an exon either begins or ends. So if you look across the top, you see the numbers one through eight, those represent the different intervals um, that, um, that represent different um, splicing patterns. So we created a, a node in the graph for each of those intervals, and those intervals are bounded by where we see splice sites. And we draw, um, and we draw edges to represent possible paths through the graph. So generally speaking, the splice graph captures all the possible alternative isoforms. There's all the possible combinations of exons and introns at a given locus. But these graphs can get very big and complicated. And in general, they'll, they'll, um, the number of possible paths through a splice graph is very large and much larger than the number of actual isoforms that are there. So somehow we'd like to go from the splice graph to a representation of what the actual isoforms or genes were that were, that were in the tissue that we were looking at in the, in the first place. So one approach is the couplings approach, which I'm um, referring to here as couplings is today, almost certainly the most widely used uh, transcriptome assembler. And it has this uh, algorithm, which is the very nice intuitive appeal that it's parsimonious. What it does is it takes a splice graph, here's another splice graph shown here, and it produces a set of isoforms that is guaranteed to be minimal in cardinality. cardinality. That is, it's guaranteed to be the minimal number of transcripts that are required or necessary to explain the pattern you see in the splice graph. So in other words, if cufflinks, as in this example, produces four isoforms, uh, we can guarantee that you cannot explain the data with fewer than four isoforms. Now keep in mind that doesn't mean that four isoforms is the correct answer. There may be a different set of four isoforms or there may be more than four isoforms that are the truth, but it, it is the most parsimonious answer. And in this case I'm showing you here, this graph is actually built from five isoforms shown on the right. So the true source of this graph was five isoforms, but Cufflinks, because it's very clever, could produce four isoforms to explain the data, which would, in this case, not be correct. So um, string tie tries um, a different approach, which is it looks at um, the transcript level, the expression levels simultaneously. And if you had looked at the expression levels for this data while you were assembling it, you might have, uh, one would hope, we would hope you would produce the five isoforms because they're a better explanation when you consider coverage. So that's kind of the key difference here. Looking, by looking at coverage or a um, uh, number of reads that are mapping to each, um, each uh, splice site, you can produce a different set of isoforms that might be a, a better answer. So how does it do this? Well, first we identify from our, um, from our splice graph, we identify the, the heaviest path. Uh, and that's, that's fairly straightforward. We use a greedy algorithm which just starts at the node in the graph which has the deepest coverage, the most reads assigned to it. And then we, when we walk to the right and walk to the left, in that graph, finding the adjacent nodes that have the, the most reads that are consistent with the, the, the path so far. So we pull out the um, um, we pull out the path in the splice graph that's heaviest, and that should represent the, the splicing variant with the greatest depth of coverage. Um, uh, and, and then from that, we build a flow network. And this is a little confusing, and I'm not going to I don't have time to go into it in great detail. But um, here at the top, I'm showing you um, a gene with four exons. Um, so that's at the top up there. 
And in red, you see all the different reads that align to that. Uh, and then at the bottom, I'm showing you the, the, uh, the flow network that corresponds to this set of exons and to this set of reads. And the flow network, to give you just quickly the idea of how you build it is you take each read or super read, as, as some of them are, and you look at where it starts and where it ends. And so you see across the top, read A, the very top read there, um, that one starts in exon one and ends in exon four. So in the splice graph, we would then create an edge, which is shown um, down below, um, that goes from node one to node four, and we'd give it a weight of one, or we'd add one to its weight, because we have one read that goes from one to four. And so we, we continue in that way to draw edges in the flow network, uh, and then we use a uh, maximum flow algorithm to compute the maximum flow in this network when we're done. So uh, maximum flow is, is an, old, uh, an old idea that goes back 50 years, actually, in optimization theory. So there are good polynomial time algorithms to find the maximum flow once we have a network uh, like this. And what you can think of a maximum flow um, solution is doing is it's assigning as many reads as possible to this particular network. So you can also think of it like a system of pipes, a network that has water going through it. A maximum flow calculation would, would figure out what's the maximum amount of water that can flow through that network. Here we're trying to get the maximum number of reads assigned to it. And that, those reads will be the ones that, that get assigned to this isoform and that determine its, its um, quantity. So uh, of course the proof of the pudding uh, is in uh, the eating. So how well does this, how well does this actually work? So here's um, some results on string tie in practice. So string tie is shown in the upper right here. Um, string tie and string tie SR is with the super reads, which is still not fully uh, implemented. So it does only a little better, but string tie itself is the, the green uh, squares or diamonds here. And you can see that it's sensitivity, and so sensitivity is shown on the, on the y-axis and precision on the x-axis. Uh, and this is for um, 150 million, 75 base pair paradigm reads. These were simulated, so we knew um, the exact isoforms that they came from. Uh, and sensitivity means of all of the isoforms that were present in the data, how many did you get exactly right? And precision is a measure of, of, the, of the isoforms you predicted, how many of those were correct. That is, you can always get better sensitivity by simply spitting out more isoforms, um, but that would lower your precision. So there's always a trade-off between them. And as you can see, compared to cufflink, scripture, isolesso, and traff, which are four of the leading uh, transcriptome assemblers, string tie is, is uh, clearly doing the best, quite a bit better here, about um, um, six or seven percent better in sensitivity than anybody, uh, anyone else, and in relative terms, about 20 percent better than cufflinks. Uh, and cufflinks, though, you can see also is clearly um, above the other, the other three programs here. We did, I should say, we did run a few other programs on this data. They generally perform, wor perform worse than the ones that I'm showing. So we're not showing those here. Um, here's some, we have many more results in our, in our recent paper. But here's some um, results on real data, um, looking at, at uh, only at known genes. So um, this is a kind of complicated slide. Um, I've circled. Um, the string tie results, again, um, string tie and string tie with super reads are the little green boxes. Um, and you can see in each of these eight plots, string tie is always uh, farthest, uh, uh, closest to the upper right corner, which is where you want to be in each plot. So these are um, at the gene level and transcript level, showing on the on two different rows, uh, four different data sets from four different tissues, uh, comparing string tie to various other programs. And the way we measured accuracy here is a little different because we don't know the truth. So what we did here was we, we said, oh, okay, we've got some real data. We don't know, and you, in principle, can't really know today what genes were present. But if there is a prediction by any of these programs and out the transcript by any of these pro predicted by any of these programs that perfectly matches a known gene, where known is the, the well-curated uh, annotation from RevSeq and Ensemble, so that is, and by perfectly matching, I mean all of the introns match exactly both their left and their right ends. So if it matches, if your prediction matches a known gene perfectly, we'll say, okay, almost certainly that gene was present in that tissue. We'll consider that to be a correct prediction. So using that as the way of, of measuring and doing it the same for all these programs, we found that, again, string tie is significantly better, usually 20% or more better than all the other programs. And cufflinks is almost always um, second best by a good margin over the other programs. So, um, so string tie is, um, um, by using this different algorithm that takes into account coverage, we think that's the, that's the sort of secret of about why it's able to do better than, than couplings. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide. So um, in addition, we get this sort of uh, side benefit, which we were always thinking about, but weren't specifically targeting with string tie. 
is that it's a lot faster than coupling. So here I have some timings on uh, just two data sets, one of our simulated data sets and one of our many real data sets from, from human kidney, um, showing you the speed in hours. And you see string time on the left. Um, uh, let's just look at the, um, the simulated data first. Uh, those, uh, that data set it took about uh, three tenths of an hour, couplings took an hour and a half, and the other programs except for ISO Lasso took um, a day or two days. ISO Lasso is also quite fast and it took only 2.7 hours, but again, slower than string time by a good bit. On the real data, it was only a slightly larger data set, but it took a lot longer. It took string tie uh, about an hour and 15 minutes, one and a quarter hours, it took couplings 15 hours, traff crashed and never finished, scripture took several days, and ISO Lasso took about five hours. So string time generally uh, compared to couplings, which is the state of the art in terms of accuracy, generally it's running uh, anywhere from 10 times faster to sometimes um, um, 20 or 30 times faster. So it's quite a bit faster. And I think part of that is because the core algorithm is a maximum flow algorithm, which we know we can solve in polynomial time. Um, and the core of couplings, there's actually an EM calculation that doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily get, uh, halt in polynomial time. So I think that's how couplings get stuck running uh, much longer sometimes. So let's finally let me go back uh, and conclude by looking at this motivation uh, that we had for string tie originally. So here is slightly zoomed in a little bit more than, than I had before. Those are those, uh, this is this gene containing these microRNAs. Um, you can see here are the two isoforms that we could not get couplings to produce. Um, this is the same exact data set that we, that we had been struggling with a couple of years ago. We ran it through string tie and string tie produced all of the isoforms you see along the bottom in black. Um, the two that I've now pointed to here in red um, precisely match those two annotated transcripts. So um, we were very pleased that after all that work, when we went back to our original example that we couldn't get right, um, the couplings couldn't get right, nor could any other program that string tie can in fact get this example right. And you see there's a bunch of other isoforms shown there. If you look at the, at the actual data, you'll see that there are um, introns present in the alignments um, that very clearly support all those isoforms. Um, but they're not in the annotation, which, which only shows two genes here. And here, just sort of parenthetically, I want to mention that this is a typical picture we see when we're doing RNA-seq analysis, that um, if you rely on the known annotation, in most cases, most human genes only have one or two isoforms shown. And in most cases, the vast majority of human genes, we know well over 90% of human genes have, have two or more isoforms um, present in some tissues. We don't know how many there are. So this is why today, given the state of our knowledge of, of the uh, human transcriptome, um, I think it's, it's always best to use a method that allows you to discover new isoforms because if you rely on annotation, we know you're gonna miss um, most of the isoforms that are present because they're mostly not annotated today. So um, I just wanted to mention uh, right after we released string time, we only released it uh, uh, recently. The, the preprint of the paper came out in February. Um, it got quite a lot of attention. Here's um, and the rain um, at North, University of North Carolina um, tried it out on some soybean data and she tweeted about it saying um, she's trying it on some soybean data um, that we're crashing uh, cuff diff. Uh, and if you look at the time here I circled, she started, the, she tweeted at 4.59 p.m. Let's try this new program out. And then 10 minutes later, 5 and 9 p.m. It's done and it works. So we were um, happy to see that unsolicited um, praise for string time. So you can get string tie at our website, which is shown here. Um, in fact, all of our software, if you go to ccb.jhu.edu, there's a software link there and this program and, and HiSat and many others are all there. They're all free and open source. Um, and the paper, as I said, um, appeared online in February. The only uh, the, the print version um, just appeared about uh, a month ago. So let me conclude by acknowledging the people who did the most of the work, especially Daywon Kim, who's the primary lead developer for HiSat and Ella Cortea, who's the lead developer for String Tie. And I'll stop there and take questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Salzberg, for that informative presentation. Uh, before, we, before we start the Q&A session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found in the lower left corner of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question from Tammy Morris, Morish, I'm sorry, uh, University of Toledo. Her question is, for fusion transcripts, how does one deal with shearing, which may lose information? These longer transcripts for looking at translocations could be a problem, or is the addressed base on the number of reads? 
So um, that's a very so that's a very good question. Um, fusion transcripts are um, uh, a fairly significant and distinct problem from the problem that HiSat is addressing. Uh, and in fact, we have another program called TopHat Fusion, uh, which is included now in the TopHat 2 release. And it was originally a separate program. So with fusion transcripts, what the, the um, questioner was asking about is you have a case where in the original genome that you sequenced, there are two chromosomes or two widely separate parts of the chromosome that have been fused together and you have a transcript that um, if you align it back to the original genome, it aligns to two distinct genes and we call those fusion genes or fusion transcripts. So you can discover those, but that's not something you can do in the process of transcripting. Currently today, our program string tie can't handle that, nor can any other transcriptome assembler. However, if you just want to discover fusion transcripts, um, we have a program called Top F Fusion, which can do that. But it's, it's a kind of a long separate topic. Our next question is from Krishna Patel from the Institute of Bioinformatics. She has a two-part question. Part one, if there are locusts with very high number of reads, for example, cases of ploidy, how would HiSat, I'm sorry, handle it? Two, and if HiSat takes more than expected time for a single run, what should I anticipate? So, um, Having a very high number of reads shouldn't be a problem. I'm not sure what you mean by that, but if you had, say, a thousand reads aligned to a single site, I, we haven't had problems with that kind of depth of coverage with a thousand or even a few thousand reads. Um, I'm not sure where things would break down, how many thousands or hundreds of thousands of reads you'd have to get before it would um, simply be unable to handle it. At some point, there's obviously got to be some limit, but we haven't hit that. So I don't think that is a problem. Um, you were asking like, when, when do you give up? When it's taking a long time to run? Um, uh, again, HiSat is much faster than uh, any other program out there except for STAR, which is also very fast. Um, we have some timings in our paper that give you sort of typical times uh, that I think you should expect for, for a typical data sets. So for data sets with, with um, 10 million to 100 million reads, it's gonna take a while. Um, but as I was showing you before, it can align, it, it's going to depend on um, how many processors you have. So I would say run it in multi-threaded mode so you can use multiple cores. Generally, you can get your results back in less than an hour as long as you, you have a multi-core computer with a, um, uh, and, and you're not sharing with lots of other people. But um, I would say look at, our, look at the high set paper for some typical timings and compare them to the size of the data set that, you, that you're running to get a good idea of how long you expect to wait. Our next question is from Rogan Rattray of Providence Health and Services. Can HiSat find local matches on a different chromosome than the anchored sequence? Well, so that's really the same as the first question um, you're asking about. Um, that would be a, essentially a fusion transcript. So the answer is no, HiSat can't do that. That's something that Top Hat Fusion can do. Um, we've already gotten this question not only twice today, but from others uh, in the last month. And we do plan to, um, to work on adding this feature to the HiSat in the future, but it's not there now. Here's another question from Cami Morish, University of Toledo. What about alternative transcripts? Would these be missed if a given exon is skipped or does the mismatch search for the next exon? So generally, um, both HiSat and StreamTire, the two of them together, um, are quite robust at finding alternative transcripts. That's what we spend most of our time in developing algorithms at finding. So um, when you say alternative transcripts, I, see, I assume you just mean alternative splice variants of the same gene. So, HiSat doesn't actually, you can provide annotation to it, but it's not restricted to that annotation. So all the alternative transcripts that are present in a particular sample that are expressed in a particular sample should be, should be found by the program as long as there's, now even if there's just one read aligning to it, it'll, it'll still find that alignment. So it's not dependent on, on, uh, on the known annotation. Here's another question from Krishna Patel. 
Can string tie deduce more isoforms if there are any compared to couplings? So can it deduce more isoforms compared to couplings? Um, so in our string tie paper, we actually did a, a, a fairly detailed comparison, which is of course in the supplement of, of whether string tie produces uh, more isoforms or whether it produces isoforms with more exons or, um, than couplings or whether isoforms that are, that are expressed at a higher level are somehow different. Um, there's no real simple summary of those results except to say that, that um, in general, um, loci which had more isoforms present were, were somewhat more accurately re reconstructed by string tie as compared to couplings. It's not the couplings got them all wrong, but string tie did a, slight, did a slightly better job as the number of different alternative isoforms uh, increased at a locus. Another question from Tammy Morish. Would this detect a transcript that may not normally occur in the genome, but perhaps is generated in a cancer genome? Meaning, would it detect aberrant splice products? So as I said already, if it's a fusion transcript, the answer is no, we would not be able to detect it. But if it's a splice product that's, that's say, um, caused by read-through transcription, where um, two, no, two transcripts maybe are merged together, we can find that. Um, if it's, if it's a, an aberrant gene product in that there's just something that went wrong in the cancer cell and, and bits and pieces of what are normally introns are expressed as, as exons, absolutely we would be able to find those. It's whatever the data, whatever the data shows us, that's what the program will produce. This question is from Kathy Cotu, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Have you compared string tie to Trinity? So, um, so that's, a, that's a good question. So as I explained at the beginning of the string type part of the talk, um, trin the, there's two generally very different approaches to uh, transcriptome assembly. Trinity is a de novo transcriptome assembler that doesn't use alignment. Um, among, there's, there's three or four such programs out there and I think Trinity is, is one of the best if not the best and we've used it in our work too when we didn't have a reference genome. However, um, if uh, we have not directly compared it but others have compared de novo transcriptome assemblers, including Trinity, to uh, assemblers like Cufflinks. And generally, um, Cufflinks will do much better than Trinity. And I think string tie will do even better yet um, because we have the reference genome to, to guide us and Trinity doesn't. So it's not really a fair comparison. So, so in general, we, we don't really see the need to do that comparison. Okay, we have time for one more question. This is from Tamim Kabir, BJRI. Do you have any de novo transcriptome assembler or DE analysis tools developed by your lab? Um, so, so no, we, we've not developed a de novo transcriptome assembler. We've developed whole genome assemblers in my lab, but not de novo transcriptome assemblers. I, I, I can make a shout out to, to Brian Haas, who's one of the uh, key developers of the Trinity program that was just mentioned. Um, Brian and I used to work together and we have some papers together, but I, I can't take any credit for Trinity. Um, he also asked about um, differential expression software. Um, the the CuffDiff package, which is part of CuffLinks, is a differential expression package. However, CuffDiff 2 is an entirely uh, rewritten or mostly rewritten package. And that was, I was not part of that effort. That was led again by Cole Trapnell. Um, at the same time that StringTie came out, however, um, uh, my colleague Jeff Leake and his uh, student Alyssa Brzee published a paper called Ballgown, um, and uh, that is a differential expression package in R. And um, Ella Cortea and I were both uh, participants in that, although it's really led by Jeff and uh, Jeff Leake and Alyssa Brzee. And we've designed string tie to be compatible with, with Ballgown. So you can take the output of string tie and pass it to Cuff Diff or to Ballgown or probably to any of several other. Uh, differential expression packages. Okay, well, that's the end of today's webcast. Uh, thank you all for attending.
As a reminder, I would like to let you all know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for six months from today's live presentation. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you again for joining us today. See you next time. Goodbye.